what's the best best thing about having a best friend is it love is it a safe space is it having someone who will stick around even though they see how really utterly truly weird you can be at times i say this because a couple of days ago i got a call from a friend and she said what are you doing so i said you know i'm sitting i'm talking to my dog and i'm telling her all about our plans for ram leela this year and then there's a pause and she says um sonali there is a snake somewhere in tokyo who knows all about how much you hate the price of bottled water at airports there's a sheep somewhere in stavanger who you told all about your first heartbreak and there is a goat in chennai who knows what your opinion is for the perfect biryani rice which by the way no matter what anyone tells you is not brown rice and then there was another pause and then she says i must really love you and i felt that this is sanalia charji and you are listening to health wealth a podcast that wants to help you understand and appreciate all aspects of human well-being i love animals i really really do i feel calmer safer and often more respected in the presence of non-human beings but that love has cost me i have been bitten four times i have been scratched i was kicked off my bed last night so like they say the course of true love never does run smooth and i say this because um it is natural for us human beings to actually see cute little puppies and kittens and feel super happy um in fact they call it the baby schema effect and a lot of researchers have been looking into it and they find that your brain releases the same chemical dopamine when you see a cute little puppy or a cute little kitten or a furry little panda bear as when you fall in love or when you have your first cookie of the day so it's okay on one hand to see these cutesy cutey beauty little things and get very happy but then given the amount of stress that we all go through today given the increasing urban loneliness given the fact that you know we're no longer staying in joint families and very often we come home to empty homes so it's natural to see these cute little things online and think that oh i'll get me one of those and you do and you're not entirely sure whether you're prepared for it or not and very recently a friend of mine did do this in fact she went out and she got herself a little puppy and then she calls me up and she says something's wrong with my puppy and i said really what happened and she said um i tried the blanket trick i tried the paper cup trick i tried the pizza and the broccoli trick it doesn't do anything that all the other puppies do on instagram and it's eaten my pashmina shawl so that's when i actually started thinking that yes this is a human health podcast but you know we don't live in isolation from the world around us so this is an episode that's dedicated towards discussing something that isn't completely human non-humans actually but aim for two purposes one if you really want to get an emotional support animal or a companion animal are you ready for it how do you get ready for it what are the species or the breeds you should be considering and number two the idea of a one world and one health for all which was also talked about very very recently by prime minister narendra modi as well which is the idea that we do not exist in isolation from the ecosystems that surround us and if we are to talk about health any health you know any sort of well-being you cannot do that if you don't consider the well-being of everyone around you and to answer both aspects we have with us today in the studio someone who is very very special to me um mr kartik satyanarayan he is the co-founder and ceo of wildlife sos um 
which every time I'm asked to describe what it is, uh, yes, they do run several wildlife sanctuaries to look after and rehabilitate animals. But for me, it's also an incredibly magical place. They work so hard and they work so tirelessly. But I personally have never seen any of them look less than happy. So I do think that there is some sort of magic which happens with the animals there. And Karthik himself is the reason as to why I have grown so incredibly aware of the symphony of nature and how various ecosystems link to one another. He was the first person to let me hold my first snake. So I'm incredibly happy he's here. Hi. Hi. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. Thank you for coming. So excited. We had this idea like months ago and now you're finally here. I know. It takes a while to drag me. <laughs> it does. So I recently, about six, seven months ago, I had a situation at home where I had two turtles, two dogs, two guinea pigs, and six fish. And for nine hours, literally, um, you know, I, I would be on a work call or, you know, something else on a weekend, but nine hours were devoted to just looking after the animals. How long does it take for you to look after your animals? How many do you have? 5,000? Uh, <laughs> yes, it does run over 5,000, but thankfully I don't have to look after all of them myself. What is the kind of effort that goes into looking after that kind of zoo? Or, well, not zoo is the wrong word, but humongous sanctuary. Well, I think, you know, if if you look at it as a chore, then it can be one. But when you look at it as what it truly is, which is making a lifetime of a difference to these animals that need that help, to helping animals in distress, then it it is um, a revelation. It is inspiring. It is very fulfilling. And it you, you don't even feel that it's work. I often tell people who ask me that I feel guilty calling it work because I enjoy it so much. Yeah. And, and uh, looking after thousands of animals can take a long time if it's not organized, if it's not planned, mm -hmm. and if you don't have a, a committed team mm -hmm. to do that. And thankfully at Wildlife SOS, we have volunteers, we have really dedicated team of staff, veterinarians, animal care staff, and we're able to really provide care um, to the quality of level and the and the degree of care that we need to provide. Yeah. So, so one of the things, um, you know, every time I go onto Instagram and I see your reels or posts, I have seen um, you, or at least the vets there, spend a good five minutes trying to get one animal to do one thing because they don't speak English or Hindi or any of our other languages. So the kind of patience that you've learned with your animals, it made me realize that you pick up so many skills when you're with, when you're looking after or you're a caregiver to an animal. What are the sort of skills you would have learned over the years? Oh, I think everything I know, everything I lo I've learned in my life, I think I owe it to the animals because they can be truly teachers. They can mentor you in ways uh, more than you can ever imagine. And I think patience... Um, is is a really important one. You know, you learn to be patient. You learn to take the time to observe. You know, I mean, I'm sure most men are, are terrible listeners. <laughs> you know, I think you learn to listen more. You learn to watch, yeah. observe uh, the little um, nuances of their behavior. What can make an animal feel more comfortable? How you can reassure uh, an animal in distress? Just changing the tone of how you speak, um, changing the way you move, you know, how rapidly you move, how aggressively you move. I think it, it can really teach us people a lot. Yeah. And they can really inspire us about in terms of grit, determination, patience, forgiveness. I think, you know, I mean, it is, it is truly like a, a religion, a pathway of peace. Yeah. Yeah. to be able to connect with animals yeah. and, and watch them and observe them. We can learn so much. I, I, and, I, and I ask this for a reason, because a lot of times, you know, the bit that we see are the nice bits. 
you know uh you know i've seen so many photographs of you with a bear hugging you and i see that i'm like i want that you know how amazing you know i wish i could get a bear and the bear would just hug me uh but what all goes on just to look after a bear you know the kind of scratches you would have got or the bites you would have got or the number of times you've been charged all that is something that's often missing and yes wildlife is something that we can't get in our homes but dogs and cats are and there has been an increase in the kind of demand for companion animals for someone who is living alone in an apartment in urban india and wants to get a dog or a cat how do they know if they're ready for it or not well i think they should um you know if someone is living by themselves in an apartment in a metropolitan city i think it's a they have to come to terms with the fact that uh, taking on a dog or a cat or a pet any pet in for instance is like looking after a baby if they are ready to have a baby if they are ready to adopt a child and look after the child commit and dedicate time to that activity you know changing diapers walking the baby taking it out on a pram etc if they can do that and they really have the time the bandwidth to take that on that is when i think they should be considering a a dog yeah. or a cat because an animal takes as much investment of time as much commitment and if if you are dependent on that animal for your emotional well-being you expect the animal to be there for you mm-hmm. you also need to be there for that animal and mm-hmm. you need to be willing to take the dog uh, for walks exercise the cat or whatever the animal or bird is but you know of late we've seen a, a huge spiraling of people getting exotic pets you know birds and all kinds of macaws and things like that and um, kangaroos wallabies i mean you name it people are are getting these but it's important to understand that you know when when people go out and buy these uh, it can very often be causing problems in the country or the place where these animals originate from yeah and if they're not indigenous if they're indigenous they're probably being harvested from the forest mm. or being plucked away kidnapped from their parents or mm. their their family herd or something like that and if it's from a different country it's possible they're not being you know born or bred in captivity so it's very important to check the source there's a lot of legality yeah. involved the government of india has now introduced a whole new law to monitor the uh, the, the management the regular the regularization uh, of uh, exotic pets yeah. in india and uh, yes that's a whole new ball game you know um the turtles are mentioned uh, they are red eared sliders and they're very very popular here and the only reason i uh, kept them is because a friend was leaving the country and her plan was to dump them in sukhna lake in chandigarh and i remember reading that this is an incredibly invasive species and it's been really harming a lot of our ecosystems so i kept them and it was exhausting just two tiny turtles they would be pooping all day long i was literally scrubbing poop then i had to get live feed for them and then i had to feed the live feed so <laughs> it was like this series of things to do it was exhausting so i mean yes forget about the price aspect um they're not easy to keep exotic something just like a tiny 2 inch turtle is that tiring can you imagine like a sugar what what sugar baby is sugar it sugar glider sugar glider from australia people are keeping them how much work and then you dump them outside that is very harmful isn't it just just dumping a strange animal into your neighborhood absolutely because these animals are not native to india and all to the to that region and uh, when people get fed up they are scared that the authorities will get after them or they feel that this is too much of a responsibility to look after or the veterinary bills get expensive then people think okay there's nobody around let me just drop it off at this lake but what for example just those red eared sliders because they're a cheap pet people get them they 
are over that, you know, hype. They mm-hmm. they initially want them. And then when they get bored, they just go and dump them in the nearest lake or waterway they find. But what do those red-eared sliders do? They start breeding. Mm-hmm. They are so invasive that they have decimated the local native population of fish and other yeah. uh, turtles. And that can damage our ecosystem irreversibly. Yeah. And, you know, uh, uh, an example, a comparable example of this is where people have imported or smuggled Burmese pythons and mm-hmm. Indian pythons into Florida and iguanas from South America. And then people didn't want to keep them as pets because these pythons grew to 15, yeah. 20 feet. Yeah. As pythons and they would release do. them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And they release them. Yeah. And now the Florida Everglades is full of pythons and they've eaten up their local indigenous native wildlife. And they're now having to give out bounties, the local animal control and the Fish and Wildlife Service. They're giving bounties to for people to go hunt them. You know, I mean, this whole thing could have been avoided if people were just responsible pet owners yeah. and were not releasing animals, either not getting them mm-hmm. or when they when you get them and you don't know how to keep them, then hand them over uh, to a place who can look after them. In fact, that is one of the big things that Wildlife SOS has been doing ever since these regulatory laws mm-hmm. have come into place. A lot of people have come and abandoned, handed over, surrendered all kinds of exotic Uh, birds and other species to us and we have an animal and bird care center uh, in the Delhi NCR and we have hundreds and hundreds of these birds that we have to look after now and uh, you know they of course the the cost a fortune but over and above that you need very specialized avian care for them Mm -hmm. so we now have an avian vet who has to look after them we have got to do all kinds of very delicate uh, procedures and blood tests and all that for these birds. And birds if don't do, do right, very well in captivity. Correct. Either. Birds don't do very well in captivity if they are wild caught. If they are mm-hmm. captive bred, then you have to be extremely careful. They mm-hmm. are delicate. Mm-hmm. By the time you figure out that they are sick, it's already too late. Mm-hmm. So it's it's touch and go in, in many mm-hmm. cases. You know, I actually blame, um, for me, um, it's the imagination of keeping an animal the allure of it, you know? So if you go onto any e-commerce website, you'll find these gorgeous looking turtle aquariums or these very, you know, fun things for a hamster. And it looks like fun, like a hamster TV or, you know, like a hamster bed. And then you steam Stuart Little and you're like, oh, I'll get this cute little mouse and it'll curl up on the bed. And, you know, you have no idea about the amount they poop all day. I mean, I have two rescued guinea pigs, I know. I am just shoveling poop like every three days. But in your head, that that's the that's the allure of it. And you get it and then you get, you know, the shock of your life. Um, supposing that has happened, because, again, a lot of working parents tend to get companion animals for their children. And, you know, they're already busy and the kids want, you know, some companion. And then you realize the hamsters not like Stuart Little. And, you know, the the turtles bite um, and the dog is barking or the cat is scratching or, you know, the bird's not, you know, cuddling up in bed with you. And then you want to get rid of them. And you said that. What can someone do if they find themselves in that mess? Um, not necessarily with wild animals, because I, I do that is still a significantly less proportion but with dogs and cats and, you know, all these domestic rodents, um, what can they do? Well, I think it's very important for people to do the right thing. And uh, in many cases, what happens is people get these, procure these puppies or kittens or, you know, rats or mice or whatever, guinea pigs. And then they find that they are in the, they, they have the short end of the stick they don't know what to do with them. They don't have the ability to care for them. But it's important for them to understand that if uh, if they've had this animal for a substantial amount of time and now it's inconvenient for them, you know, it doesn't suit them, they cannot palm off that responsibility to someone else without a consequence. There is a consequence to that. And I think it's important for us to introspect, you know, whoever it is. Uh, 
if they want to abandon it is abandonment it is nothing else but abandonment okay it's it's not responsible parenting whether it's with a child or a non it's a human animal we are all human animals okay or a non human animal there's only two forms yeah. of of uh, living species <laughs> and when you do that yeah. would i think everybody has to think would if they had a an uncle who's paralyzed who's blind who's lame who's inconvenient you know he needs to mm-hmm. his he needs to have his a grandparent needs to have diapers changed etc would we dispose him of well these days we do tend to um put them in old age homes correct correct but do we abandon them do we abandon them i yeah. think that is not as common you know abandonment of a child who's inconvenient you, you know a, a child is born with one eye one leg would you dispose him of i know it happens occasionally but i think it's important for people to th- consider that but if they want to hand over an animal which they cannot look after they must have this conversation in depth not just tie it at some lamp post leave it at some street corner near yeah. an animal shelter and it's walk a off a lot of the dogs that end up actually biting uh, people on the road cuz i've been bitten one and it wasn't a street dog actually it was a indie that belonged to someone and was thrown out so that trauma does tend to make them quite aggressive of course and abandonment is not a nice thing you know mm-hmm. when any pet is is abandoned it's lost it's confused it's scared, scared. it's frightened yeah. it is going to lash out mm-hmm. at at anybody because it doesn't know what to do and mm-hmm. is looking for its lost family um it's it's wondering why it's been mm-hmm. dropped off this way and it's important for the parent or the person who's giving up this animal to do it responsibly contact an animal mm-hmm. a shelter or a place like friendly coast for example we'll be happy to guide them too but it's important for them to then commit to the financial care of that animal till the animal is you know is is going to be around or the other sensible option in some cases is rather than subject an animal to a lifetime of trauma do the right thing be responsible and maybe subject the animal to euthanasia in mm. the person's hands yeah. you know Yes it might not be as pleasant hmm. but at least the animal is in your hands and it trusts you and you know it passes away in peace and tranquility it's not a very nice subject to discuss but you know just think of we've got to think of the animal and the situation that they're putting the animal in yeah and also the environment around them because um, you know you leave them on the street and they're going to harm somebody exactly i think one of the reasons why people tend to um throw away animals is also the shame or the embarrassment that i failed um you know these these dogs and cats are brought with a lot of expectations and love um and and you know over my lifetime of the limited experience i've had with all my animals i can never predict their personality how they're going to turn out So you know I I got a shih tzu um you know which our friend had uh, bred at home and then we adopted one and I was thinking oh this is going to be one graceful dainty little creature take him to a salon what do I get I get a barbarian who will you know fling himself into the mud and get into the guinea pig cage and eat that poop and you know he eats his own poop which is really really it 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 it's quite something you know and it's an embarrassment you know when he does it with guests over but i have to make my peace with that just as i would if you know i i got a new friend home or you know or if i married the wrong person <laughs> so but i do have to and i think that's also where people tend to goof up a lot that you're not you see a dog as a dog like a very broad generic thing and there's no such thing right there's a whole spectrum of dog personalities um for someone who's just got a new bed a dog or a cat let's take um with a non typical personality how do you create a bond so i i i think um what you bring up is is very important and i think a lot of people will benefit from this discussion so i i've noticed that it is possible to create not just bonds with animals uh, but also because of the simplicity of their their processing you see animals don't have agendas like people have they don't have secret agendas 
They're not in there in that relationship to get your money, your property, or anything. All they want is love, and they're will, willing to give their unconditional love. And it is possible to do very carefully calibrated operant conditioning for animals. And all it requires is a little bit of patience from the human parent and some amount of investment of time and maybe some resources. I've noticed that people usually end up abandoning an animal because, you know, it's barking too much or scratching the floors or, you know, it's unpredictable, etc. And I think it all comes down to assessment. Sometimes if you do a patient, carefully calibrated assessment of that behavior, and you might need professional help sometimes, you know, call a, a special expert who can come. And we've I've done this for some of our animals, you know. The traditional way of um, getting, treating, giving any medical treatment to an elephant, for example, <laughs> yes. is to... I know where you're going. <laughs> frighten the elephant, yes. torture the elephant, yes. force it to lie down, yes. and then one man is standing over it with a bullhook, threatening to beat the hell out of the elephant. Another man is chained and hobbled the elephant. And then a third, the veterinarian comes and takes, uh, draws the blood from the ear of the elephant, okay? Now, look at it from the point of view of the animal. The animal does not enjoy this experience. He is traumatized, he or she is terrified, hates those people, hates the experience, does not want to have anything more to do with these people or that experience. Now, we have those same very elephants at Wildlife SOS trained with operant conditioning for the specific purpose of medical management. And all we have to do is link that desirable behavior. What do we want? We desire that we should be able to draw blood from the elephant's ear, from the vein, uh, in a way which does not traumatize the elephant and people are safe, right? And we can do that. We need to do that on a regular basis to monitor the health. So we do that. If, if you can believe it, with just peanuts and chanas and little treats like bananas. Mm. And all we have done is connect that behavior that we want to a treat. And today, we can get uh, the elephants at our rescue center, at our hospital, which is just a couple of hours away from here in Mathura, there where elephants will happily come to a wall, put their ear out, and all we have to do is give bananas or, or peanuts, yeah. you know, or chanas. They'll put the ear out, wait for us to draw the blood. And all we are saying is good boy or good girl. And you can do that. And so if you can do that with an elephant, you can do that with bears, yes. you can do that with yeah. dogs, you can do that with cats. And it's, I mean, you if you can train dogs to be seeing eye dogs for the blind, you can train them to smell um, money, drugs at airports. How difficult is it to train a dog to behave better, you know? It is It is totally possible. Yeah. All it requires is some introspection, assessment, and a plan to do that. So if people are serious about addressing that, I think that is a very good direction that they can adopt. And, you know, things like eating their own poop, et cetera, sometimes it comes from a, a mineral deficiency mm -hmm. or a calcium deficiency or something like that. And that, those things can be addressed through other... Uh, it's, it's still traumatic the first know, time it happens. <laughs> um, but of anyhow, um, I think another thing is also we think as human beings and we forget that dogs really aren't that smart. Correct. So like my Shih Tzu was, de was deathly scared of a razor. And now what do you do? These are dogs who are growing, you know, hair at like, I don't know, a, a length of a minute, I feel. Um but I just left him alone with the racer. Because for him, he couldn't, for the love of God, figure out what is this thing. It makes a noise and it's weird and mama's putting it near my eye. Like, it's just something wrong. And I left him alone for like days and days till he just got very used to it. Um, and so once, once they know that this thing is something, you know, that's just there, it just lies around, doesn't do anything, then it feels a lot safer for them. Um, and, and I said mama just now, which is bringing me to the next topic, which I wanted to talk about, is that um, we're all becoming mamas and daddies to our dogs and cats as well. There is that ha that bit happening that, you know, people are no longer owners of dogs. 
we are parents or we are caregivers. So that's a very positive thing. Um, and then it's going one step further where we also want to incorporate animals in a lot of um, things that we do for human peace. So we have goat yoga, that that's a thing. Uh, we have puppy meditation and we have kitten pilates. I see the allure of it again, but I wanted to ask you as an animal expert, is it like the cutesy little turtle aquarium tanks? Is it just, it, does, it, does it sound better than it might actually be? I think it does. I think, you know, that is, that is the, the trap that, you know, these things do lead us into. It might sound attractive, it might sound nice, it might look appealing and alluring. But I think the first question we need to ask ourselves when we look at something like this is, is the animal at ease? Or does it enjoy the experience as much as we might think we enjoy it? Is the animal going through that? And if not, I, I, I doubt if the animals, if the kittens, the goats and the puppies are enjoying that process as much as the people yes. think they do. They do Being not. lifted up. Uh, I wouldn't want it to be that way. Exactly. And it's also yeah. important to understand their background. You know, is is somebody just using them as a reason to increase the clientele yes, and the price exploitation mm -hmm. of these animals so it's really important while it might be okay you yeah. know if if the animal is at your house and you're doing your yoga when i do yoga i always have i i had this dog who loved my yoga teacher yes. and my yoga mat yes and before i could descend on the yoga mat the dog was there and um she would always sit on the yoga mat and sometimes leave a little gift, you know, a little puddle. Mm. And I would have to wipe it before getting on the yoga mat. See? So, I mean, in such a situation, you know, the animal is not being traumatized or subjected to any forced behavior. Mm. It's important. You know, there are these five freedoms. Uh, freedom to display normal behavior, freedom from fear, freedom from hunger, freedom to, um, you know, ex to freedom from me medical distress, mm. things like that. And it's important that we can tick off these five freedoms mm. for any of these animals. Do they have the ability to express normal behavior? Can they go away if they don't want to? If they're being contained, restrained, restricted, then obviously they're probably not having a great time. Yeah, yeah. So I think if you look at it that way, I think, you know, you can do your own yoga in your house and have a goat, cow, <laughs> puppy, horse, anything you want, yeah. as long as they have the ability to come and go as they please. And yeah. I think that will change things a lot. Yeah. Um, I've actually been to quite a few of these animal cafes, um, both in the UK and Japan, and um, it's amazing how responsible they are for the animals. So they make it very clear you cannot run after them, you can't, t you know, sort of touch them if they don't want to be touched. Um, in fact, one of them said, our animals are not here to help you gain more Instagram followers. So they ban you from taking videos with them because they found that, you know, it is a thing, you know, in this world where, you know, being different, being unique is like the fastest way to get people to follow you. Um, you know, puppy yoga sounds ex excellent. Um, but having said that, like, I've, I've gone to all these animal cafes and I've kept my own animals, but nothing beats seeing them in the wild. Nothing. Absolutely. Um, I think all of us, even those who are really, really scared of animals, because it, we belong to the forest, you know, we've come from there, we're biologically wired to be in natural spaces. In places like, I'll, I'll just give you three cities because you can't cover all of India, but in uh, Delhi, Bombay and Bangalore. Are there some spaces where you, you could suggest where, where one can just go and um, immerse themselves with the wildlife? Absolutely. I think what you say, you know, hits the nail right on the head. As people who originated from the forest, as homo sapiens who, and we've done a lot to damage this planet, I think it's important for us to reconnect again. Yeah. And the joy that we get when we see green spaces, open outdoors, yeah. forests and, and wildlife, I think is really important to understand that you don't have to possess an animal. You don't have to have it in your room, in your in a cage, inside your house to enjoy it. You can have the same joy of watching, you know, a big flock of parakeets or, you know, a bunch of hornbills fly overhead. And, and you can really get a kick out of that. 
going bird watching, going wildlife watching, or even volunteering at a at a wildlife center would really give you a lot of fulfillment. I think people can really um, take away a lot of inspiration uh, from that. And, you know, talking about Bangalore, for mm, example, yes. you know, there is, um, there is a national park in Bangalore City called the Banargata National Park. And in fact, Wildlife Hesus runs a, a very large bear rescue center mm -hmm. in uh, Bangalore. And we, in fact, have a lot of volunteers who come there. Mm -hmm. It's in the middle of the forest. It's very pristine, beautiful area. We also have two tigers that we've rescued yeah. from conflict situations and um, poaching situations that are in our care. Yeah. And people who come and volunteer with us can come and spend the whole day with the wildlife SOS team. Some people even stay overnight and many other days as well. Mm. Uh, but they get a chance to see local wildlife, watch them. You can see bears, tigers, but also lots of birds, reptiles, etc. And then, so that's that's definitely possible. But not far from Bangalore City itself, you have Nagaruni National Park, you have the Bandipur National Park. And then overnight train journey takes you to Hampi, where you have the Daruji National Park. I mean, it's really no end if you want to see the outdoors. I mm. think the opportunities are plenty. And in Delhi? In Delhi, of course, you can go to the Asola Bati Wildlife mm -hmm. Sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's harder to see much wildlife. But if you want to come and volunteer, you have the Wildlife SOS and the Frindicos Animal mm -hmm. Sanctuaries just in Delhi NCR, where people Which can is come. in Gurgaon, actually. In Gurgaon, yes. Yeah. And people can come and uh, spend the whole day volunteering with the Frindicos team and the Wildlife SOS mm -hmm. team, helping care for animals. I think that is really very fulfilling. I find that very, it, it gives you so much relief, you know. And if you're coming from a from a background of, of corporate or yeah. work culture, where you just want to release and exit from that, I think this is the best way to forget yeah. that completely. And also, not very far from here, uh, you have the Sariska National Park, you have Rantambur National Park. Both are just a few hours drive from yeah, Delhi yeah. if you want to get See, away. I never understood these uh, national parks, you know. Um, for me, in my head, it's like a, a trained package safari, you know, which doesn't sound very relaxing. So how do you get the most of going to these So national you don't parks? go there with expectations. So for me... Uh, a safari drive in a, a game drive in a safari park or a tiger reserve is not about looking for a tiger or what for anything. What is the fun of that? So I go there yeah. with complete zero expectation. Okay. I go there and say, show me, you know, show me any birds you see because the, the safari guides are trained to show people only tigers. So they mm. go tiger, 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 tiger. All they want to do is chase tigers, yes. zip around like mad hatters and, and that's what they want to show you. Yeah. But I tell them I want to see everything, you know, from a checkered keel back in the pond over there. And they're like, what? This is what you want to do? I said, show me everything. I'm here to see the jungle. Yeah. And I stop and gaze at trees, look at the foliage, look at, you know, Alexandrian parakeets, look at the grey hornbills, uh, the owls, the bee eaters. Mm. I think that's the beauty of the forest. Yeah. And I found invariably when I go there with no expectations, I end up seeing a bunch of tigers. <laughs> and and so I'll tell them I, I'd like to see a hyena. They say, yeah. to koi hyena ke liye nahi. Yeah. Sab tiger dekhna uh -huh. hai. And I say, well, I mean, if you can show me a hyena, a striped hyena, that would one of my favorite animals, by Mine the way. Too. <laughs> I find them so fascinating. Yeah. And I've uh, me and, and the team at Wild FSOs, we've raised uh, baby hyenas, and they are so incredibly amazing. Yeah. And such uh, personalities. Uh, and then put them back in the wild. So, so tell me about Bombay. Uh, for oh someone yes, living in so Bombay. Bombay again, um, very close to Bombay. You have, of course you have the Borivali National Park where mm -hmm. you can walk, and I think mm -hmm. there's a ton of leopards in there. But you can also very close to that, just three hours away, two three hours away, is incredible Western Ghats. And Wildlife Service has a leopard rescue center over there as well. We have, I think, between 50 and 60 leopards at any given point of time at our facility. Yeah. But near that, it's just a paradise for birds and reptiles and and waterfalls. I mean, in the monsoons, you see waterfalls literally every half a kilometer. Mm -hmm. And it's just so beautiful. And you can see everything over there, you know, in terms of uh, unique species of lizards and calotus and spiders and, and snakes and frogs. Yeah. It's a paradise for frogs and, and that kind of, um, you, you know, amphibian um, life. Mm -hmm. 
It's just amazing. And I think it's very important for people to open their eyes to beyond the 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 very sexy, very glorified kind of species, you know, tigers, leopards, elephants. Yeah. You've got to look beyond that. Yeah. You know, yeah. look at look at the 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 unique beauty of nature. The like thing. the wine snake. <laughs> Sorry. No, the thing is, Karthik, um, I think when we step into the jungle after being in an urban space, we don't know how to disassociate from this life and enter into that space at all. Um, so there's this very beautiful thing in Japan which is called uh, Shinruku, which is the art of forest bathing. So I remember doing this in Delhi. Um, there, there's some forest bathing clubs here. And because you're so used to hearing sound and seeing things, you know, just look at us in this room, there's red, there's, you know, there's stimulation all over the place. And you go to the forest and you're like, it's it's empty. It's it's strange, you know. And I remember the first thing they say is, uh, "We're going to walk for hundred meters with your eyes closed." And that itself, like shutting off some of your senses and reconnecting with other senses, suddenly you hear the forest come to life because there is sound, and you're just not hearing it at the same uh, volume as you know a traffic jam in Delhi. But um, it is there. And I remember that when I did this, um, I had just seen a documentary which talked about how older ancient forests, are their roots are interconnected, that trees speak to one another. I remember doing this, and I, I, I was I have an overactive imagination. And I was actually almost hearing the trees speak to one another, which was very relaxing, you know. Um, that's something I think... You know, we just tend to become so overactivated in these cities. I wanted to end this with um, a conversation about One World, One Health. A lot of hospitals, I think, in the U.S. now have started saying that, hey, look, we don't have space to treat our animals and our humans. Let's use the same infrastructure for both. For, cause, because for mammals... It's almost the same thing. It's an MRI, it's a CAT scan. Why not reuse it? You know, I, I, I love that concept. And I know that there are um, clinics in Delhi which are also considering this now. Um, and that's beautiful. But tell me, like, why is my health and my well-being not separate from the health and the well-being of the planet? It's not. It is why? one and the same. Why? It's one and the same because... If the planet gave birth to us, the planet was here before us, the animals were here before us, human beings have learned everything we use, we do, we consume. What do we do as people? We're born, and then till the day that we can stand on our own feet, we're dependent on our parents, mm -hmm. right, as offspring. What do we do during that period? We consume every single day. Everything I'm, from the watch I'm wearing to the clothes I'm wearing to the shoes you're using, Everything here in this room, in the studio, is all taken from nature, converted and reused, repurposed. But as, and, and let's say we've done that for the first maybe 20 years of our life, okay? After that, we start being independent and then we do what we want. And then let's say beyond 80, you know, there's not much, we, we can't be as productive as we can be. So we have about 60 years in between, right? 60 years of useful lifespan. And what is a life? A life is an extrapolation of a day. A day is about 24 hours, right? I wish it was more. I often wish I wish I had 48 hours in a day. But in 24 hours, we spend about eight hours commuting, eight hours sleeping, eight hours actually doing things that we need to do, right? So that's about one third of your day that we can actually make a difference with. And if you extrapolate that, those 60 years that we have left, it's only 20 years. That's all we have to make a difference bef before we are six feet under, right? What do we do with those 60 years? We use it up in pursuit of ambition, material happiness. We want to do this. We want to do that. Get vehicles and property and this and that. And cookies. Yeah. but Which is not a bad thing. No, no. I'm not talk I have nothing against cookies. <laughs> what I'm saying is that what do we yeah. do in those 20 years 
to give back to nature. I mean, Mother Nature has been so generous with us. She's given us everything we, we've ever wanted people. Although she can't support human greed, but she still tries her best, right? And we really uh, mind the hell out of her. But yet, if you look at it that way, each of us, you know, at the end of our lifespan, when we look back, what have we left behind? Except a trail of consumption, um, you know, and, and tearing things up. We've not really given anything back. And I think giving something back to each of us in our lifetimes is about the creatures that Mother Nature has, you know, whether it's an animal, a tree, or both of them, and the forest. I think it's really important for us to ensure that well-being, which is directly connected to us. Like you said about the tree roots all mm -hmm. connected. We are all a part of this. Yeah. And we cannot separate ourselves from this. And one going missing really impacts everything because um, this was so fascinating to me that in Sri Lanka, one um, farmer told me, do you know the footprint of an elephant in the wild creates a habitat for microorganisms? And I was like, gosh. So Absolutely. if the elephant goes away, then your insects aren't born Correct. and then they can't pollinate and then, you know, your forest basically starts to die out. That just blew my mind. So just that one thing going away can create such a havoc. I think people fail to understand that, you know, the bees, we all keep, I mean, I think Noida is full of play, people trying to get rid of beehives in their buildings. Okay, they burn them, they smoke them, they chop them up. But do we realize that if bees don't exist, we don't exist. We don't exist. We will not get any your no tomatoes, what, no what onions. What does one do? I don't want to get stung. I don't want to come for a podcast with you know hives on my face. Wear glasses. What do people think? <laughs> what do you do if you no, see a so bee? Bees don't sting unless you actually try and poke them around. You know, so that's one thing that's that's really important for all of us to understand that animals are not. We're not on their menu. Yeah. We're not on their list. We're not on the hit list, you know, n n neither a tiger, nor a wolf, nor a leopard. Nobody is interested in us. I mean, we are probably the most disliked species anyway. And neither are snakes interested in us. Yeah. If we just leave the hell alone, leave them alone, I think nobody is interested in us. But I think putting them in the wrong sp position, yeah. the wrong circumstance, putting ourselves in between them and, and the corner of a room, that's yeah. when, when they feel cornered that they hit back. Yeah. So I think it's really all about understanding, having the patience to understand the eco ecology, the behavior of that particular species, and then understand. We have a team right now with the forest department in Bahraich, mm -hmm. talk, you know, trying to get people to understand about these wolves. Now, wolves, a, a, this part, you know, the wolves in the plains, are not the gigantic wolves like the big bad wolf of North America, you know, yeah. where you have these giant wolves. A pack of wolves can't yeah. take down a person or a moose, mm. you know, or, a, or a, even a big bear possibly. But the wolves here are like jackals. They are really small. They're puny. They're tiny. They're thin, scrawny. You'll mistake them for a dog. If you, if you drive past one, mm. you probably won't even stop mm. to look at it a, a second time. But so it's important for us to sometimes demystify these things, mm. investigate. Mm. That curiosity is essential for us to understand, is this really something that can happen? Mm. Not just fall in line with the rumor. Rumors mm. are easy. Mm -hmm. Bad news sells fast, you know. Mm -hmm. It spreads like wildfire. So it's important for us to be responsible. Yes. I mean, each of us has to be a journalist. Mm. Get in there, find out, is this true yeah. or not? Yeah. And I think that's why it's important that we connect ourselves to everything, you know, climate change, all these... Uh, landslides, these floods, everything is connected to our bad treatment of nature. And if we can address that, I think it can it can all get fixed. And one health is really important. We've got to understand that if we can promote kindness and compassion, I think it comes back, yeah, you know, yes, to us. Is. And actually, um, I had a f friend come down. She's, uh, she lives in the hills in Meghalaya. Um, and she came down and she was terrified of my coffee capsule machine. And much in the same way that I am if I see a bee. Um, so that's what I was just realizing that it's, you're just not used to having bees around you. So maybe, you know, one would find all the suggestions you've given us very, very helpful to sort of um, reconnect with nature and uh, give something back to the planet because it does ultimately give it back to our health.
Thank absolutely, you. absolutely. And and if people want to try and you know understand more, they're happy to come and volunteer with Wildlife SOS. And I think it might and you, and just open a window. And you'll teach them what to do if they see a bee. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> Thank Bees you so and everything much. Else. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mentioned elephants, but another creature that I really recently came to know about um, has a huge impact on human health is the whale. And I remember asking um, this doctor, this was actually a pulmonologist who told me this, and I remember asking, I was like, okay, what about the whale? They're, they're not even on land. They're like really, really far away from me. And she said, um, you know how we're all complaining about pollution? A whale feces actually is the reason why phytoplankton gets created in our oceans. And phytoplankton is responsible for over half the oxygen we breathe. She also said that when a whale dies, it takes with it down to the ocean floor about two tons of carbon, and that there is research which shows that one whale is worth a thousand trees. So she said that um, if you go into the ocean and you find it stinking really badly, or the water is giving you rashes, or you're finding you can't breathe properly, don't point fingers all the time. You know, don't turn a blind eye to the what you're doing with your ramen packet, or the fact that you would very happily spend two hours in traffic to go to a party, but you will not spend that kind of effort to find a good recycling unit near your house. Or do not ignore the choices you're making every day, which is not only contaminating the ocean, but also ending up contaminating the whale carcass, which then sinks down and then spreads you know, a lot more pollution in the water, which comes back to the air and comes back to you. And I love that. I really did. Like It really impacted me so deeply to hear an allopathic doctor um, look beyond you know just the cars and the vehicles in the city and and see the entire planet as one whole interconnected network has this podcast helped you better understand if you're ready for an emotional support animal and the ways in which animals can benefit your mental health or are you going to end this and think that oh my god a human health podcast has been hijacked by two animal fanatics and considering that goats poop something like, I don't know what, 75 droppings per hour, is goat yoga really that peaceful? And if you've tried it, how did that go? Do let us know your thoughts and experiences. You can write to us at pods at indiatoday.com or you can message us on 85889 and I myself am like a goat sometimes. I have a bleating heart. So I would love it if you enjoyed this episode. You left us a good rating. We are there on Apple, YouTube Music, and Spotify.